reboot it. Hey everyone, I'm Ron Swallow and welcome to Reboot Rewind. That's right, I can say reboot correctly. This is the oh. official after show for Reboot It. Today, I'm joined by Ed Greer and producer Bill to talk about our monumental season two finale, the reboot of the Fantastic Four. Let's get on everybody here. Oh, that's there a good we one. Are. Here, here we go. It was, oh man, I looked thin for a second when there was just that. Oh, yeah, you want to go back to that? You want to go back? <laughs> no, no, I'll be bursting out of it like a burger. In a <laughs> Welcome to the show, guys. We got Ed Greer. What's up? We got producer Bill. What's up? What's up? <laughs> so, you guys, when, uh, when we thought season two was going to be our quarantine season, were we so optimistic or weren't we? <laughs> Somebody just wrote a comment about this, and I, I forget where, like, on which episode it was. But somebody said, like, uh, it's so maybe even Billy was talking about how it's so weird that the original setup of the show, our season one setup, has now become the outlier because we've done two full seasons and about a season and a half of rewinds in this setup. So now this is just the norm. This quarantine, everybody's in their own space. I still personally like the original setup, but yes, we were from the mouths of babes when we said that season two was our quarantine season. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I think we all thought that everyone would behave and like it would work out fine. You know what I mean? Mm, mm, therein yeah. lies our idiocy. Yep. <laughs> hey, but you know what? As the cynical one of the group, I kind of believed it too. So I, I got duped. See, see what you get for thinking positive losers. <laughs> no, but You'll never do it again, Ed. You've yeah, learned your no. lesson. I, look, I'm done with being positive. That's... that's <laughs> It's gone. I'm not. Finally, we've joke. cracked Ron. Finally, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we need it now more than ever. <laughs> I know, right? So let's talk about how this one came about. Came about. Who suggested this? Do we remember? I think this was one that was on our vision board, for lack of a better way to put it, from season one. Like the first time we we started talking about expanding beyond, you know, the original six episodes. I think this was up there. Yeah, I, I envision this much like uh, like the Predator and his wall of trophies, but there's like this big hole right there where the <laughs> such and such elephantisis beast of the, of the whatever planet, his head's supposed to be there. I feel like Fantastic Four from the get-go was something we had to hunt down and kill. And we I think we were trying to build up our reserves, you know what I mean, to try to get ready to go hunt that beast because... The failed reboots were really daunting in my mind. I mean, it it, yeah. it 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 was like one of those things where obviously the low expectations helped us, but at the same time, the low expectations kind of dovetail into high expectations because people feel like anybody could do better, you know? that That's really interesting to me. The one thing I will say about this episode that caught me way off guard was the viewership numbers. Like, this is one of our most popular episodes, and a part of me felt like we were barking up the wrong tree when we made this, like, a big finale event, because I was like, well, film YouTube definitely does not hold the Fantastic Four in high esteem, and mm -hmm. comics YouTube isn't going to get excited about the Fantastic Four, just because I feel like they've been dissected to death. Like, I don't know, I just, this, this got way more of a response than I was expecting it to. Yeah, I, I I I felt the same way. And you know what I liked about it though, if I remember correctly, we did Green Lantern the first episode of that season, right? We did, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then we ended, so we took we started with a a dog shit that we turned into something great and we ended with something that was terrible that we turned into something great. So I think that's like a pretty nice capstone to the season as well. And I think that's also something that's been on our mind a little bit because sometimes we want to reboot things that are really hard to reboot, but then every once in a while, you just want to fix something that was awful. Yeah. I think that's by far the more fun exercise, more yeah. rewarding at the end. Cause you know, it's, it's in a, in a way it's a little bit easier to be like, well, they did the perfect version, so now let's do the crazy version or whatever, you know? Yeah, Harder absolutely. Harder to do the perfect version. Now, the other question I have is uh, we knew that we were when we decided that rebooting the first Fanta the Fantastic Four 
was not only going to be our final episode of season two, but then we decided to do it live. Uh, how did you guys feel about that? <laughs> and I, I, I kind of just... remember, I kind of <laughs> remember Ed thinking that was a terrible idea. Am I not? I I think it would be, it sounds like me, but overall, <laughs> I think because like, you know, a lot of these things I have misgivings about, but I think I thought everything I thought about it came to pass it, that we found a better story almost instantly, but all the surrounding ephemera eluded us for like almost about 30, 40 minutes after we basically had those, all the story beats down coalescing everything else, all the real, you know what I mean? All the, it was almost like we, we got a skeleton quickly, but a circulatory system took a long time and the lungs and the heart and stuff took a long time to really build. We had a skeleton that seems like like that, but it mm -hmm. becomes a two hour episode when we're trying to actually make it a living, breathing thing rather than some kind of weird <laughs> rotoscope skeleton. Yeah, I mean, I do think on the live of it all, we were um, we were hesitant from the beginning. No offense to all of our awesome commenters and the people who are participating in live chats because we love doing it. But I think that we were a little bit worried about our ability to split our attention like mm. actually make the people in the live chat feel heard and feel a part of the episode, but still keep our heads in the game enough to keep the ball rolling down the hill. Mm. And to a certain extent, I think we were right to be afraid of that because I don't think we did a great job. And I think that's one of the reasons why when we went back to the live episode well in our Justice League season three finale, we really didn't include the live chat in any meaningful way. Again, yeah. not trying to snub anybody, but just trying to like do the mental work necessary to make this stuff sing. Mm, yeah, yeah uh, the, sometimes multitasking does not actually add uh, to the quality of one's work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I will say this too: I have a better time engaging with the chat when we can do it post facto. When we yeah. record this, release it live, let the let the premiere chat happen. And then we can just be in there interacting with people. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think in the future, if we do live episodes, it's going to be more like the AMA, where the whole point of it is just, hey, let's interact, rather than, hey, let's try to do this thing and also pay attention to you guys over here, which is just hard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a hard time like reading something and then listening to my uh, girlfriend talk to me at the same time. Like I can't do anything. Mm. That, so that for me, that's definitely going to be a mess. I'll end up like just paying attention to the to the comments. You guys will have said something. I won't hear any of it. It'll be great. Uh, there was a comment uh, that maybe uh, uh, later on that is uh, uh, maybe related to that. By the way, mm. we'll see. Uh, but uh, do you? Were, uh, one thing I was wondering: Did you guys feel it was more daunting because there have been so many failed Fantastic Four reboots, or less daunting? Head. Mm, I mean, overall, I felt like, like, like I said in my opening uh, spiel, it seems like it would be easier, and it wasn't. You know what I mean? Because it felt like, oh, we'll just do better than that. Well, I mean, frankly, I'll speak for myself and probably for the rest of the group, frankly, just a bit better than what we've seen before isn't what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. So that made it turn into a task. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just being slightly better than the versions that we had before. And we also ran into the Justice League problem of a lot of the bones of the Snyderverse are good. Yep. Period. Yes. You know, so we run into this problem with the Fantastic Four movies weren't all the way off base in how they treated these characters at all. It was just a matter of certain like, hey, man, you cook some cookies with too much flour in them. It's a disaster. Flour is one of the main ingredients you need, but too much turns it into a freaking disaster. Yeah, yeah I, I second that completely. And I, I, you know, we ran into this issue where, where Marvel solved this problem somewhat elegantly with Spider-Man when they just decided we're not going to do Uncle Ben. Because yep. you can make the argument that neither Tobey Maguire nor Andrew Garfield's movies nailed the origin. I would argue that maybe neither one did. But to do the origin again, just to make it, like you said, Ed, a little bit better than the ones they already did, just feels a little bit like, God, please, no. 
-hmm. And I, I felt that same way about the Fantastic Four. It's like, you kind of need the origin, especially if you're going to introduce them into the MCU. But the origin's already been told twice. And just by necessity, it's been almost the same story both times because that is the story. So you get into this, you know, and then the other piece of this too, just in terms of what is daunting or what is not, everybody is going to bring their own personal headcanon into this of like, well, the way you get around the origin is you do it this way. And yeah. that's why I came in hot from the beginning of like, listen, the thing we're not going to do is that 1960s bullshit that all you motherfuckers think is, you know, the thing when it's not the thing. Not Ben Grimm, but, you know, the thing that works when it's not the thing that works. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, also, hint, hint, there might be a comment having to do with that a little bit later, too. Let's just do it now. Let's just do it live. <laughs> Freaking do it live. You want to do the you want to do the comment? You want to do the the longest comment of all time? (laughs) Oh, it's it's definitely not the longest though. I'll I'll refute I'll rebuke that right now. I've that's a good point. Novellas on there. Well let's let's talk about this. (laughs) Oh Langley. Oh yeah, it is. This my favorite moment of this episode is Bill trashing on the idea of displacing the F4. What a smart guy. (laughs) <laughs> into the present as bad because I totally disagree. LOL. Oh, I rescind that completely. Rescind it <laughs> yeah. completely. Good job. I normally agree that fan ideas are almost 100% garbage and don't adhere to logical story needs, but blah, 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 da, 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 Mr. Fantastic coming from the 60s to right now where he should thrive technically. Maybe it's interesting that he might not be as progressive as he thinks. You know what I mean? Like those Star Trek dudes until smack ladies on the ass and wouldn't let them wear pants. You know what I mean? He says yeah. something about that in there somewhere. Yeah, somewhere in there. And then he says, I think the Fantastic Four can work with or without time displacement, but I just think you dismissed it, dismissed it way too easily where there is so much potential. And to that, I say, <laughs> well, and I think we discussed a little bit while we were in the episode. It's like it's been done. We did it with Captain America in the MCU. We don't need to see it again. I mean, he didn't do the like being progressive thing, but Captain America was already kind of progressive in the first place. So. Look, I, you know, it, I, I'm being funny. I think I think Langley is a smart guy, and he comments on a lot yeah. of our stuff. He seems to be a big fan of ours, and we appreciate all of his interaction. I will just – he he made a point that, like, yes, there is an interesting story to be told about a man who sees himself as the man of the future arriving in the future and suddenly being treated or feeling like someone who hasn't quite caught up. I get that. It just – it literally is a mashup of Tony Stark and Captain America. And, Absolutely. And at this point, we already have Tony Stark light in Doctor Strange. So just don't try to serve me another Tony Stark. That's, I don't know. I just feel mm-hmm. like it goes back to the conversation about the origin story, right? Like we're, we're dropping this into the MCU. Don't give me a character that has already been done well twice before again. Yeah, and agreed. I, and I'll say I'll say one thing for this. I think, uh, well, I think it goes to another comment that we had, right? Isn't there another one about like us? Um, because I, I want to talk about. Well, before we do that, let me yeah. just let me just throw out the pitch, and then we'll yeah. that that way we can address some of the uh, the questions about the pitch as well. So this so, is not to interrupt you, Ron, but this pitch yeah. is interesting because there have been some official developments in the MCU since then. Oh, yeah. Kind of seemed to line up, but let's go. All right. So the pitch. Sue Storm is an agent of S.W.O.R.D., which stands for Sentient Weapon Observation Response Division. She is assigned to keep tabs on enigmatic industrialist genius Reed Richards. Her brother Johnny Storm is a pilot in S.W.O.R.D., and Ben Grimm is his superior officer. Ben and Johnny are part of the platoon of S.W.O.R.D. agents sent along with many of Earth's mightiest heroes. Their mission? to take on a threat that approaches from deep space. Sue thinks that this is an obvious trap, and after trying to convince her superiors this is a bad move, she goes to Reed Richards. Reed fires up a teleportation machine, and they go to rescue Ben and Johnny. The event happens. 
which causes all of the superheroes to disappear and blows up the sword base. Our four heroes are the only survivors of the event. They are bathed in cosmic energy as they teleport back to Earth. Unbeknownst to them, the event was a trap sprung by a scroll sleeper agent, Earth, and Graviton, a shield sword scientist willing to betray his planet for superpowers and a leadership position. The unique energies of the event transformed the undercover scroll scientist into the super scroll. The super scroll has flame powers, the ability to change into rock, stretching powers, and invisibility and powerful force fields. He's by far the most powerful super being on Earth. When Reed, Sue, Johnny, and Ben get back to Earth, they discover each of them has one of the Super Skrulls' powers. All over Earth, secret skulls emerge to take over the planet now that they have a champion. The Super Skrull is holding our planet hostage until the Skrull Empire can get here and fully take over the planet. Graviton goes on a crime spree, pulling up old shield bases, stealing secrets, etc., with no one to stop him. So it is up to the Fantastic Four to stop the Super Skrull, root out the scroll's secret invasion, stop Gravitron, and get all the heroes back from the negative zone. The fate of the Earth depends on whether this group can become a family and whether this family can become a team. Cast, we got Lakeith Stanfeld uh, as Mr. Fantastic, Emily Blunt as Sue Storm, Ethan Supley as The Thing. Is it Supley? Supley, I believe, yeah. Supley. And uh, yeah, Ethan Suplex, because he's really buff right now. <laughs> He is super buff as the thing. Joe Keery or uh, Doc Ray Montgomery as Johnny Storm. Daker. Daker, Daker. Montgomery. Is it Daker Montgomery yeah. as Johnny Storm? <laughs> Russell Crowe from Super Scroll. He's going to be the Super Scroll. I think that was a brilliant mwah, moment of casting. Uh, Gravitron is Eddie Redmayne or some TV actor. Uh, <laughs> directed by Steven Someone Spiller. from Supernatural? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> This bit take, Ron. <laughs> Jared Padalecki, I believe we took this time, you oh, guys. Texas Ranger, get out of here. Man, that <laughs> looks like trash. I'm not going to lie to you. I, it looks like trash, and I am uh, upset about it, but we're not talking about that. Um, I think a, a, an appropriate comment after reading that entire uh, pitch to you is uh, – were there any reservations on the multitude of story elements? Is it too busy? Um, and I asked this because we got a comment from uh, Moramoth Hans. He said, rewatched for funsies, and I like it a lot more. Just thought Secret Invasion might sound too much like Hydra with Winter Soldier. Uh, is there a little too much? What do you think? Well, it is worth saying that Kevin Feige doesn't agree with you, Marmoth, because they have since announced they are doing a limited series called Secret Invasion. And we've already seen Nick Fury in, I believe, the Spider-Man Far From Home. Yeah, yep. Spider-Man Far From Home post credit series building what seems to be a sword orbital platform. So yep. there's a lot of our pitch coming to the MCU. I still wouldn't necessarily be surprised if they tried to tie the Fantastic Four's origin into Secret Invasion. Will they do it the exact same way we're talking about here? Maybe not, but I could yeah, see I, it. I think, I think they're going to draw it out more, which is the reason why they're considering it a series. Whereas I think we, or I'll just speak for myself. I personally want to see that over and done with because I don't get the V, like that old ass show V with the lizard people. Yeah. I just, I don't get that. I don't get that, and I don't really like that that much. You mean you know the show that made me have nightmares about my parents <laughs> being lizards for over two weeks? Yeah, I remember well, that show. If your mom would stop eating those mice, I mean, if there would be any confusion. Oh, man. Ugh. Wait, man. <laughs> and they ripped the skin off her face, and it's just a lizard underneath. Oh, no! <laughs> so uh. what I'm saying is I think overall we thought that that might be an interesting wrinkle to throw in with these humans who are the only super people on Earth and try to do super stuff. I think we may have envisioned maybe that them not being able to trust anybody being part of what brings them together as a team. I know we always add a bunch of major story in the rewinds, but I think that could be interesting to me. Like there's the only people they for sure know they can trust are each yeah. other. And well, and force them together. And on, on top of really that, I love that we got rid of all the other heroes so that they are kind of forced to be the heroes. We don't have to have cap show up and help out or, anybody ant-man show up and help it, whoever 
Uh, yeah. None of those guys are going to show up to help them out. It's up to them to solve the problem and get the heroes back so they don't have to only be the only heroes. It's it's very true to the Fantastic Four as written in the comics where you know they are sort of superheroes by accident, not by choice. Yeah. They're, you know, they're explorers and scientists by choice, and they really get into superheroics just because situations get out of hand. And I think we stayed very true to that in, in this conception here. To, to your point, Ed, about kind of how to use Secret Invasion, I see maybe a little more value than you do in playing, you know, the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy note with Secret Invasion, where it it's a slow burn and like, are they here? Who do you trust? Who's really a scroll? And yes. milking that. I do think though, there's an equally valid story decision to drop it like a bomb. You know what I mean? It's it's such a one-two punch of oh my god, the heroes are gone. Oh my god, now there's a super scroll. Oh, there's not just a super scroll, there's literally an army popping up all over the world that's already been here. There's no way to win. It's that idea of like you're conquered before you even know that you're conquered, and it's just the final axe dropping. Mm. That's that's a cool way to use the idea of a secret invasion. Like you don't have to have some street level weird detective spy story going on just use it as like oh you think you have all these other defenses nope they're gone because we've been working on it for 20 years and nobody caught us you know yeah, that's it just it, in that way it's a it's a sophisticated version of order 66 yeah exactly exactly yeah and also i i, I think that it's it's also daunting i mean it, it, one of the things you learn when you're first learning about storytelling is that there has to be risk and your your heroes have to be put in a position where it, there's no way they can win. Like it, it has to look like they can't win and all of those different things coming to literally be on their shoulders, I think makes a story that puts them all at risk and then also puts everybody they care about at risk as well. So that it, it just adds more uh, danger to the whole situation. You know, yeah. one of the things that we didn't mention in the recap that is sort of relevant to what you just said, Ron, is the way we use Dr. Doom in this movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it was just such a, yeah, go ahead. It's great. No, but I mean, the idea that like you get one scene with Doom and he's already Doom and he's running Latveria and he's the only person they could trust, even though it's the last person in the world that Reed would want to go to. It's just that last desperate gamble. But I mean, this could happen early act two, right? It's literally like, oh my God, there's no superheroes. There's no military coming to help us. Half the governments in the world are already run by aliens. Who do we go to? The last person we want to go to, Dr. Doom. It's almost like where their journey starts. And you get in Castle Doom at the foot of Von Doom. And he just says, no, you're screwed. Like if they come to Latveria, I will deal with them the way... I deal with them, but everybody else is screwed. There's no way to win this. They've already won. It just lays down the gauntlet immediately of like, oh my God, like the stakes, to, to Ron's point about stakes, it's like the stakes become immediately overbearing because even Doom, who already is like their last desperate gamble, is like, yep. oh no, you're effed. Like, mm -hmm. don't come to me with this. I can't do anything about it. And so mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, now what do we do? And I think that desperation, again, to your point, Ed, that idea of like, we literally have nobody to trust or rely on except the four of us together just forces that family dynamic. It's really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's get to some more comments. We've got uh, Pooh Man, great name, Pooh Man. <laughs> uh, Ron's so freaking random, LOL, completely on a different wavelength to everyone else. Love it, though. Keep up the great work, boys. <laughs> I don't even realize what how, was I? What did I say that was weird? I don't understand. I'm, I don't trying, understand. I'm trying to remember. No, I, I think that might be uh what you call those uh lifetime achievement Oscar. Oh okay. you know <laughs> <laughs> that I think that might be one of those. Like he just he loves your energy, period. So you just wanted to express it, and it just happened to be on this particular uh, I mean, look, I, I throw out weird ideas a lot. And we've we've talked about this. Sometimes my ideas are dumb. I'm not going to pretend they're not. 
But one of the things that I'm good at is throwing out a bunch of ideas, and then one of them is a killer idea, and it's one of the ones that helps us move along. So look, you throw stuff at the wall. I've been doing comedy for 25 years, and in that 25 years, I've thrown away probably thousands of jokes that I've tried that just weren't good, that I rewrote, and I couldn't make good. But I've also kept lots of jokes that were really good. That's kind of how this stuff works. Um, and especially if you're someone like me who's not afraid to just say whatever's on my mind. Like, maybe I should think a little more. I'm not going to deny that. <laughs> but we're yeah. in the middle of doing being creative. Sometimes you got to throw out the idea. As we have stated a couple times on this program, one of the reasons why this show exists is you throwing something random out. And a lot of times I do agree when we're when we're in a rut or even when we're, sometimes we're not. When you just – when you're willing to go – hey, everybody should be in this movie. Or, hey, what about this guy totally not being in there and it's a mariachi band instead? And we go, <laughs> no, it's not a mariachi band. We had one of those in the first act. And then, we, <laughs> and then we do something else. It like yeah. it spurs something almost always. So, yeah, I, I never – and I don't really treat it like from the mouths of babes type stuff. I mean, some of the weirder comments, I feel like those are from the mouths of babes. Sometimes you just come with, with some super smart stuff and it ain't like random that you meant to do that. So I'm giving you props on that one. You meant to shoot that three quarter court shot and swish it you meant to you take a bunch of them you break a bunch of them but you meant to make that one one of my favorite uh ronisms is when we'll be in the middle of talking like really debating something and maybe even running up against the wall and ron will just be like hey what if we cast uh timothy oliphant in this part and it's like ron we're not even talking about casting it's like yeah i know i just thought of it it's like <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes Sometimes they're brilliant and sometimes they're completely derailing and there's no way to know which is which, but it's just to the, to the idea of it being a different wavelength. We're aware of that too. Sometimes Ron just like comes in from outer space yeah. and you know, it's part of the charm. Yeah. It's who yeah. I am. Like, yeah. you know, I got a, I got a dragon over there. I got a <laughs> hammer. I've got, you know, a bazillion books. I'm a weird guy. All right. That's, that's how it works. There but thank go. you. I'll take the compliment. We got another comment. Let's read it. It's really long. It's not that long. <laughs> this is a nice one. It's by Alden uh, Diaz. He said, just wanted to come back to the video and say I had such a blast watching live, hearing what you all had to say, finding out what other fans wanted, etc. What a great time. Can't wait for these rewind episodes. And I really can't wait for season three. Love this so show so much. Now, the reason I put that one up is not not only because it's great and it makes us feel good, but also uh, the, the live aspect and uh, uh, having fans talk to each other about stuff is one of the reasons I think that this has been great because it was kind of unexpected. Like having a community of creatives who have come together and while they're not necessarily on the show, they're coming up with their own ideas and talking to each other and becoming friends, I think, as well, is mm -hmm. pretty cool. That's one yeah. of the reasons why we wanted to start doing the rewinds is because you guys bring so much value to the show just in the way that you respond to what we do. You you need to get your due. I mean, that's why we're doing what we're doing here. And mm -hmm. I, speaking specifically to the Fantastic Four episode, the, the idea of casting the thing as Terry Crews just randomly caught like wildfire in that chat. Yeah. And it was something that like wasn't even prompted by us bringing up who should play the thing. It's just they decided to start casting before we got there. And <laughs> the chat just went wild for Terry Crew. Of course, we threw that out completely because we don't yeah. care. But it was a great time when it was happening. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but I, but I think, it's a, and that's one thing I, I think is really good about, I, I don't want to wax our car too much uh, more than this whole enterprise is, but... I think we had reasons every time we don't go with the flow or go with the fans. I think we have rock solid reasoning behind it. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. think Terry Crews got shot down as of course the Jewish ancestry is a, a, a great part of the thing. And also I just think the, the sheer, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just like the, I, I, Terry Crews is, is older than the demographic of what we wanted. So it was like there was two strikes against that particular casting that really did make sense. Yeah, and so. I don't – look, Terry Crews is great, and I 
I have no doubt he could handle serious acting as well, but I don't see I don't see the thing as comedic as Terry Crews is, if that makes any sense. Not that he the, the, the thing can't be funny, just like I, I don't think he can be hilarious. Just my opinion. I don't think he's at, as slapstick as Terry. Like Terry Crews is usually just wired. He's got that yeah. wide-eyed thing going on. And yeah. I, I yeah, I agree with that, Ron. I always feel like the thing you know, as much as he might be a big burly guy who gets angry sometimes, he's he's more quiet than I ever pictured Terry Crews being. Yeah, agree. Well, just just a little bit in, in regards to when he's funny, it isn't because he's mostly trying to be funny, unless he's trying to woo a gal or something, you know. But when he's just being a regular guy, I don't think he's trying to be funny. If he's a soldier telling you an order. You don't think he's the funniest damn guy in the world. You don't see the blue-eyed, ever-loving thing. You see Ben Grimm, your superior officer, who's about to get in your ass. And I think he wears that a whole bunch. So he gets down to Yancey Street with his buddies, and maybe he'll relax a little bit. But like, I don't see him as being funny to the average person who comes across him or whatever until you get an intimate thing with him. You know, I totally agree with that. And I think one of the one of the reasons why I really keyed into Ethan Suppley is because ultimately, when after the thing transforms. He's kind of morose. And yeah. like you you need somebody who can who can play sullen without it feeling like petulant, without oh, it feeling pouty. like yeah. yeah, pouty. And I think if you especially if you look at something like what Ethan Suppley did in Remember the Titans, um, he played this role that like he was a sad sack without feeling sorry for himself. And like he had these little victories in that movie that just felt like tear jerking triumphs. Like he can play a soulful character while still coming across as kind of brutish, kind of uncouth. I, I just honestly like I love that casting. I, I kind of am going to be disappointed when Ethan Suppley isn't the thing whenever they make the Fantastic Four because I honestly think that's one of the more perfect castings that we've pulled out of our butts. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was great too. Yeah, well, I was watching the episode again, and the fact that I, it was, I said it in the middle of trying to recommend somebody else or to try to qualify somebody else. Yeah. And like, yeah, Bill just sees that. I'm like, ah, don't bury the lead. That's the guy. And it's like, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you think about this type, and nobody yeah. ever considers to go get that type, meaning that guy. They always say that type, you know. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad we could rescue Suppley. And plus, he's earned it so much. A, he's still got great acting chops. He's got so much good acting experience. And he has built himself into something that would be believable as the thing. So, I mean, much props to him all the way around. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and then we got one from our buddy Hector Navarro, which was cool. Oh, yeah. uh, he said, this is one of my favorite episodes, and I wished I was able to see it live, and I wish I could jump into this convo more than any I've seen in a while. I have thoughts. Great <laughs> job, guys. Uh, I just wanted to put that because Hector Navarro is awesome. And if, if anybody, uh, if you get a stamp of approval from Hector Navarro on something you did that has to do with comic books, uh, I feel like that's an accomplishment. Yeah, seconded. One of the things that you guys have asked for in the chats and in the comments is for us to start bringing guests onto these rewinds. And it's something that we've discussed as well. And I think we just haven't had the uh, like the time and energy to be able to produce something like just to coordinate having guests. But it's not something we're opposed to for the rewinds. Um, so in the future, maybe just, you know, it's something we got to we got to commit to if we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought before before we were actually okay, breaking breaking cafe before we decided on this day to shoot this. This day to shoot this was too soon for me to build the infrastructure to really ask him and have him set aside time to be near his mic and not be doing other stuff and all this kind of jazz. So, uh, and I was gonna pitch it to you guys before I obviously asked him or whatever. But like, yeah, I think he would be particularly good on this one just because of the huge amount of com comic book history. That frankly, can we talk about how we just chucked it out the window? Like a lot of it, like, and, and like in hardcore, the way that I like to do, you know me, I like to come in and see a big brontosaurus steak and just be like, this is good, but there's a lot of fat and gristle over here. And like these food metaphors, guys, there's no wonder I'm so fat. But anyway, you, 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 <laughs> you, you just pair away all that stuff. Let's say it's a statue. What, what did homeboy say? I just chipped away every part that wasn't David. 
He had a big giant block of marble. If you look at how much marble he wasted getting to David, it's probably a lot. And that's what we take with these comic book histories. We shave off so much of it that we get to what it actually is. Marvel's done it to great effect. And I think us making uh, Sue Storm, besides the Ethan Suffley thing, the thing I to completion myself the most about in this episode is Sue Storm suggesting that Sue Storm should be an agent of some sort. Yeah. Because her having the info and her being the one who takes action and gathers the team up is smart period. It's the only, it's the only role she hasn't had yet. Yeah, absolutely. I think she's a great sort of heir apparent to that black widow role in the MCU even though I know Ed's erstwhile girlfriend, Florence Pugh, is picking up the <laughs> baton, I do think that like she's ultimately going to have a different presence in the, in the ensemble. And I think that sort of female leadership role is perfectly tailored to the Sue Storm character. Well, if I remember correctly, I think this last comment will probably go well with that. Uh, I think a good fan... This is from Marcus. Uh, I think a good Fantastic Four movie should feel like a cross between The Incredibles and Rick and Morty with a little bit of Archer. It needs to be big in scope. It very much needs to be an origin because the accident is supposed to be tragic and traumatic. The movies have yet to capture that. I love the idea of the movie being centered around Sue, but I don't think any other heroes should be in it. The focus needs to be on the four. I think a space road trip movie with the scope of an episode of Rick and Morty and the family dynamic of the Incredibles and the humor of Archer would be something no MCU has done before. Lakia Stein Stanfield as Reed Richards, Samara Weaving as Sue Storm, Ross Lynch as Johnny Storm, and David Diggs as Ben Grimm. Now, look, a lot of that I think is ridiculous, but Sue Storm being an important part of the Fantastic Four, and maybe even the most important part of the Fantastic Four, that part I 100% agree with. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the space road trip, uh, where we're getting there. Like, is it literally just because you want to have like a family in a Winnebago just out in space sort of a thing? I, you know, that part <laughs> of the pitch, you lose me. Also, yeah. kind of kind of weird when you're like, no other heroes should be in it, and it's like, one of the premises of the movie is that we are literally finding a mechanism to get rid of all the other heroes, which I actually think is important because yep. it's not just like, yeah, let's sequester the fantastic four over in their own little corner. It's literally like, let's without making it a retcon without making it set in the sixties, let's find a way to introduce the fantastic four the way they started, which is like, we are the only people to fight these weird, crazy monster threats um, at the time because no other heroes existed. And in our movie, because we're finding a way to get rid of the other heroes. I don't know. I think it's clean. I mean, it was one of the things that, that we insisted upon and that, frankly, I insisted upon early on that I felt like maybe I had to step back and be like, maybe I'm being whack about that. Like, because there are ways to just sort of and then I was like, no, no. On this one, you're right. On this one, you're right. You did see a burning bush, and it wasn't just from natural phenomena. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we had to make it have the Fantastic Four are people who fight stuff that the Avengers fight. And yep. normally, because they explored some stuff and then found a creature who could beat up the Avengers and have to subdue them some kind of way or whatever, you know, all the, or get put on trial by a race that could kill Galactus three times over or whatever, you know, there's all these type of things that happen to them that frankly, if they happen to the Avengers, it's, it's still the same story. It's like the Avengers would have to fight hard to defeat it. So that's their MO. And I also wanted to do something where when the heroes come back, they still have mad respect for these fools. Yeah. No matter no matter what, it isn't just that the B team won the game. No, 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 no. This new squad came and won the All Star game, the Super Bowl, everything all together. You must respect these dudes. And guess what? They're not a bunch of soldiers. They're not a bunch of dudes with the flag on their chest and, and missiles on their back from Uncle Sam. They didn't get trained by spy schools. This is the private sector. As I stated in the episode, <laughs> this is intelligent from the private sector. And yes, somebody who is an agent, but knows that y'all are messed up and doing dumb stuff. And when Sue throws her badge in at the end of the movie, that's a big, heavy deal. Like when all the infrastructure comes back, she doesn't go back to S.W.O.R.D. because now she's part of an, a, 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 an organization 
that is altogether better than all of that, better than the Avengers. But the people, the Avengers and sword that everybody comes to in the future when the stuff goes down are these dudes right here. Dude, I there even as you were just talking, there's an amazing scene to be had at the end where you if you can somehow mimic like um just the feel of that moment in endgame when all the portals open. It's like the heroes come through ready for an epic battle, and it's just the Fantastic Four with Reed Richards with a little remote control being like, Hey, how's it going? And they're like, Is the alien invasion happening? They're like, No, we took care of that. It's mm -hmm. a little bit like what? I mean, you you almost cut out of the movie on like weird looks being exchanged. Like <laughs> what the? Fuck? It's like and then cut to credits. You know, it's there's something amazing to that. I think you hit the nail on the head, Ed. It's like you you completely shake up the the balance of power in the Marvel universe when it's like these four whack jobs just repelled an alien invasion and depowered you know a cosmic menace in the form of graviton it's cool yeah yeah it's pretty awesome um and we got one more comment and then we will uh get out of here uh this is from crimson knight um i can't believe you guys actually achieved reboot on fantastic four congrats for doing the impossible this episode can't wait to see what other cursed franchises you can save next season <laughs> Well, you know, it. we did Waterworld. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah. Uh, can, can, can we talk for a second just about the MCU? This is something that people have brought up in, in comments kind of consistently. This idea of we need to, I, I don't know. I don't, even, I don't even know what question to ask, but like, do we bring the all the X-Men into the MCU? Do oh, we yeah. reboot the MCU? You know, it's like people want to see us tackle the MCU in a more substantive way, especially coming off the back of our whole DCEU revamp. What do you, how do you guys feel about that? I'm not even asking, are we going to do it or not? But how do you feel about the prospect of that? I mean, I love it. Um, <laughs> you know, after doing X-Men, uh, not X-Men, after doing Wolverine, Mm -hmm. uh, and the Fantastic Four, and including them within the MCU universe, um, we can include both of them in there. I think that it's a possibility that we could go off of what are those uh, those two things that we've done and and uh, expand even further. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, this is what I think. I think we're gonna eventually, if the show keeps going on, eventually end up rebooting Iron Man and Thor and this, that, and the other. You know, it's just gonna happen if it if it goes that long. I personally find the great challenge in getting to these things that haven't been done before the people do and mm. doing our take and getting that out there. Like I would love for us, frankly, to do how we would do Shang-Chi, not just because we're interlopers who want to steal yet another job from from uh, you know uh, asian individual writers but just to see what we would come up with and then take take it and look at what they do with shang chi how did they bring him into the universe as the uh gong fu influence of marvel universe everybody can fight everybody's got a little muay thai but this guy is going to come through and whoop everybody's ass or or look as though he can so how do you introduce that to a world full of fighters? You know what I'm saying? How, uh, the whole X-Men of it all. We must do the X-Men because I really feel as though the challenge is how we would bring the X-Men into a universe that already has the, all the iron people and the radiation experiments and so on and so forth. And last but not least, we in the Wolverine movie, we did stuff like bring back uh, the Abomination. We can look at the people who are in jail, the people who are shackled from other adventures and other movies and try to find out what they could conceivably do with them in a cohesive universe. That to me just seems like such a great project that I would like to complete that, complete the set of adding these things to the universe before we tear it all down and start over. That's my well, I yeah. What about like the Hulk, for instance? Because technically the, the solo Hulks were not great, neither one of them. Um, so it'd be interesting to try to reboot the Hulk. I mean, like there's, there's a, Dude, there's the some solo options. Hulk movie is pretty, pretty ingenious. Like, I don't, I don't know. The only reason why they're not happening in real life is to deal with universal. So yeah. if we, in our fantasy could figure out uh, a way to resolve that issue, what sort of adventure would you have with that? I mean, you know, do you do the maestro thing? Go, do you go to the far? Frankly, I'll throw this out as a little nugget. 
do you go to the far flung future so that he can indeed be the only hero that survives? Because uh, spoiler alert, guys, he's one of the only ones. It's him, Silver Surfer, and Ghost Rider roasted marshmallows at the end of time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's it leaves up to options, and I, I definitely am interested in that. And the rebooting Hulk goes with our want to reboot things that have turned out bad, like yeah. Daredevil. Like as a movie, for instance, I, I, yeah, I mean, very interested in that, but I would have to billy myself a little bit. I would have to be like, whatever you guys say is okay. We don't need to have stick. I'm not going to fight dude. anybody. I'd have to be really like that on it. I was yeah. going to say, I, I feel like Daredevil is like sitting out there taunting us just because of Ed's great love and the fact that the last version was so beloved and the way that all ended and people still oh. have a bad taste in their mouth. And we're going to come up in here and be like, F Charlie Cox. And people are going to be like, you sons of bitches. But, <laughs> but I will agree that like the, the great joy of tackling any of these MCU properties is essentially playing Kevin Feige and asking mm -hmm. that question of like, how do we fit it into what's already there while also trying to maintain what makes it great in the comics? Mm -hmm. I, I'll end with this the one that we haven't talked about that is sitting out there just teetering on the edge even more than Daredevil is Blade. Yep. yep. Uh, oh, yes. You yeah. know what? Some MFers are always trying to ice skate uphill. <laughs> and we are those MFers, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That that would be fun. That would be fun. Well, that's the that best goes tease possible. <laughs> By the way, Ed, we haven't talked about this, but that goes with uh, some comments that came up in the live chat from the last re from the last rewind. Somebody suggested that you and I start a podcast called Ice Skate Uphill, where we <laughs> just talk about um, we just talk about movies that like bite off more than they can chew and do a really bad job like exploring their <laughs> themes or whatever. That could be the that could be the uh, the other side of the coin of positive spin. Ron show about <laughs> like like stuff. That's well, a great I was idea. thinking it could be a companion piece to sugar coated topping, which <laughs> is which is where we take movies that are really dumb and juvenile and try to read like intense philosophical treatises into them. I can't oh, wait to we'll do that for Biodome. One hundred percent. Biodome, sugar-coated topping, and then uh, um, Jupiter ascending, ice skating uphill. I Perfect. Mean, writes itself. Oh, yeah. and, and one of those, uh, do Junior for one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Either one, really. Either, Either one. one. Man. Oh, man. <laughs> That's the thing. We could really do any movie in either style, right? <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Beautiful. I love that idea. So, guys, I think that does it for the Reboot Rewind. Uh, on behalf of myself, Ed Greer, producer Bill, and Billy, even though he's not here and decided to take care of his kid like an adult. <laughs> R.I.P. Billy Business. <laughs> thank you for hanging out with us. We want to thank you guys for watching and being part of this really special community we built here. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.